Okay, so recall the problem. So consider the objective function p equals 8x plus 3y, subject to the constraints, negative 5x plus 4y is at most 8, 7x plus 5y is at most 63, and both x and y are non-negative. In the previous video, we found a way to maximize p using the geometric method. In this video, this will be our first example of the so-called simplex method. So we will maximize p now using the simplex method. So, let's go through the steps. The first step is to transform these inequalities into equalities. So if you think of it, you have negative 5x plus 4y is at most 8. So there's a little bit missing here so that this quantity is equal to 8, right? As this value is smaller or equal to 8, if we add the negative 5x plus 4y, just the right amount, we'll have it equal 8. So we'll need here another variable, and we'll call it S1. And if we just pick S1 to the right amount, this will equal 8. Well, same for the second inequality. We have 7x plus 5y, and this is at most 63. Well, if we add to the left-hand side just the right amount, will make this equal to 63. Of course, the amount that we have to add in this case may be different than the amount we have to add in the first case. So we need here another variable, call it S2. And if we add just the right amount to 7x plus 5y, we'll be able to obtain exactly 63. Now we give these two variables special names, we call them slack variables. Okay, so this is the first step, how to transform the inequalities into equalities by adding up so-called slack variables. We want to rearrange then, this is the step two, the objective function. So we always leave p where it is, and we subtract everything else to the other side. So the inequality, or I should say the equality, if you send 8x plus 3y into the other side will become negative 8x, negative 3y plus p equals 0. And always be careful. We always leave p on the left hand side and send everything else to that side, so it will always remain positive p. So this becomes negative 8x, negative 3y plus p is equal to 0. Step 2 is complete. Now we will form the so called simplex matrix because what we have now is a linear system in three equations, but now five variables, x, y, s1 is 2, and p. So first equation, negative 5 times x, positive 4 times y, plus 1 times s1, there is no s2 in the first equation, so it has a coefficient of 0, there is no p, same thing, and the result is equal to, vertical bar, positive 8. Second equation, 7x, plus 5y, there is no s1, so 0 coefficient, plus 1 s2, there's no p plus 0p equals 63. And we now use a horizontal bar to separate the equalities coming from the original inequalities and the last equality coming from the objective function. So always remember, what goes on top of your simplex matrix are the equalities constructed from the inequalities by adding up the slack variables the bottom row will always be obtained by transforming the objective function. Now the equality becomes negative 8x, negative 3y, 
there's no S1 or S2, so 0, S1, 0, S2, 1 times P equals 0. So now we have the so-called initial simplex matrix. The question is, well, how do we transform this matrix in order to obtain the optimal solution? What we'll do looks a little bit like row reduction, but not exactly. There are some really key differences. So let me just walk you through the algorithm. If you look at your bottom row, there are two negative entries. We will reach the maximum possible value of P once there are no more negative values in the bottom row. There may be zero entries, not a problem, but we have to find a way to eliminate the negative entries, and this is done very specifically. We always pick the largest negative entry, now we ignore it, and we consider the entries above it in the column. Then we only consider the positive entries, so we ignore negative entries. If we had more positive entries, we'd consider them as well. And what we compute for each positive entry in our column, here we only have one, we find the ratio of the constant term over the corresponding entry. So here we have 63 divided by 7, which would give us 9. If we had more positive entries in this column, we do the same thing. We pick the constant term over the entry and have the ratio. The question now is why? Well, the entry, giving the smallest ratio, will be turned into a pivoting 1, or if you prefer, a leading 1. Well here, as there's a single positive entry, we have a single ratio, so this entry wins by default. But if we had, say, another entry here that was positive, where the constant term over this positive entry gave a ratio smaller than 9, then we would turn this entry into a pivoting 1. Well, how do we turn a 7 into a 1? We multiply this row by 1 over 7. And always be careful, we must multiply the entry by its reciprocal. We cannot use the other rows to make this happen. So let's do so. So multiply row 2 by 1 over 7 to create our first pivoting 1. So we can recopy row 1 and row 3 as we're not changing them. times 1 over 7, so we get 1, and we'll circle this one, as it is our first pivoting one. 5 over 7, 0, 1 over 7, 0, 63 over 7 is 9. Okay, now this is where what we'll do next is exactly like row reduction. Once we have our pivoting 1, or our leading 1, we use this 1 to kill the entries above and below. So we'll do here row 1 plus 5 row 2, row 3 plus 8 row 2. So let's perform these two operations. We can recopy row 2 as we're not changing it now. 5 over 7, 0, 1 over 7, 0, 9. So let's do this row first. So row 1 plus 5 row 2, negative 5 plus 5 is 0. 4 plus 5 times 5 over 7, let's do this here. So we have 4 plus 5 times 5, 25 over 7. But 4 is 28 over 7. 28 plus 25, 40 plus 13, 53 over 7. Let's keep going. 1 plus 5 times 0 is 1 plus 0, which is 5, which is 1, sorry. 0 plus 5 times 1 over 7, so 5 over 7.
0 plus 5 times 0, 0 plus 0 is 0. 8 plus 5 times 9, so 8 plus 45. Well, 5 plus 8, 13, plus 40, 53. All right, this takes care of the first entry. Let's kill now the negative 8 by doing row 3 plus 8 of row 2. So negative 8 plus 8 is 0. Negative 3 now plus 8 times 5 over 7. Well, 5 times that is 40, so plus 40 over 7. 3 will give us negative 3 times 7, negative 21, plus 40 over 7. But negative 21 plus 40 is 19, so we get 19 over 7. Zero plus eight times zero is zero plus zero, which is zero. Zero plus eight times one over seven, eight over seven. One plus eight times zero is one plus zero, one. And zero plus eight times nine, seventy-two plus zero, seventy-two. So this completes the first step of the simplex method. Now, we look back to our bottom row. And you can see all entries are non-negative. This means that we're done, that we have attained the optimal solution. If there were other negative entries, we would simply repeat. We would single out the largest negative entry, look at the positive entries above, find the ratio of the constant term over the corresponding entry. Whichever entry has the smallest ratio, we would turn into a leading one and then kill the entries both above and below. But as here all the entries are non-negative, we're done. Well, how do we read the optimal solution from the final simplex matrix? Well, if you notice, there are really two types of columns here. We have columns with all zeros except for a 1. Then we have columns that don't have a pivoting 1 or a leading 1. So what do we do? Well, let's recall that this was the column for x, for y, for z, whoops, sorry, it's not z, it was s1, our first select variable, s2, and this was for p. So there are two types of variables, the ones with a pivoting 1 and the ones that don't have a pivoting 1. So we call the variables with a pivoting 1 basic variables, so x, s1, and p are called basic variables. And the other variables, y and s2, are called non-basic variables. The question is, well, what do we do with them? Well, for the non-basic variables, we always set them to be equal to zero. So we set y to be zero and s2 to be equal to zero. That's the first step. So if a variable is non-basic, if it doesn't possess a pivoting one in its column, it is set to zero. But now think back to each row giving you an equation. If y is equal to zero, any multiple of zero would be zero. So this column becomes irrelevant and the same for s2. If s2 is zero, anything times zero is zero. And now we can solve for our basic variables using corresponding pivoting ones. So let's solve for x. One times x plus zero s1 is zero plus zero p is zero equals nine. And so we get that x equals nine. We can solve for s1, 0x plus s1 plus 0p is just s1 equals 53. And finally we can solve for p, 
0x plus 0 is 1 is 0, plus 1 times p is p, and this equals 72. And that's how you should read the final simplex matrix. Set all the non-basic variables equal to 0, use the pivoting 1 to solve for the corresponding variables, and then we can write our conclusion. As far as the stack variables are concerned, we don't care about their values. We can ignore them. And now if you look, the optimal solution to the maximum value of p being 72 was achieved when x was equal to 9 and y being 0. And p attained its maximum value of 72. And you can go back to our previous video where we solved the problem geometrically and we arrived at the same conclusion. The maximum value that p attains is 72 and this is achieved when x equals 9 and y equals 0. So that's it, our first example of the simplex method. In the next video, we'll consider another example of the simplex method where now we'll be dealing with three variables. So here, solving the problem geometrically will be rather difficult and so the simplex method will provide a very pleasant alternative.